Welcome to Stuff You Should Know, a production of iHeartRadio. Hey, and welcome to the Purdcast. I'm Josh Clark, and there's Charles W. Chuck Bryant, and Jerry's over there somewhere, and this is Stuff You Should Know. The Purdcast? <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> I think so. You sounded like uh, Kristen Wiig's Target Lady character. I'm not familiar. Welcome to the Paired Coast. Oh, no, wait. That's a different character. What character was that? <laughs> I don't know. I think that was Mike Myers' uh, Scottish guy. No, not that jerk. <laughs> I don't know who then. Oh, I'm blanking. People are screaming at their radio. I get it. Uh, oh, is that well known of a character? Their AM, FM radio that they <laughs> used to listen to. This. So how is this coming through? It's like one of 50-year-old podcasts. Mm-hmm. It's true, a 50-year-old is podcasting before our very ears right now. That's right. That's me. You can't de-age me, running, Martin Scorsese. Running circles around the younger ones, Chuck. So hats like to off to so. you. Um, so, Chuck, have you ever seen The Simpsons? Oh, boy. You got one for me? Did you ever see the one about the murder house where Marge becomes a realtor? <laughs> you mean a certified realtor? Yes, of course. <laughs> What other kind of? Uh, uh, I don't know. Remind me. Oh, so anyway, Marge becomes a realtor, and <laughs> she, uh, I think, with Lionel Hutz's realty company. Oh boy! And it's like a <laughs> kind of like a Glen Gary Glen Ross spoof is like that that mm-hmm. little uh, uh, subplot. But um, she she uh, tries to sell a, a house that like a multiple murder was committed in. Uh, to Flanders and his family back when Maud was still alive. And she doesn't tell him it's a murder house um, and feels like a tremendous amount of guilt and then finally, like, confesses. And I don't think they end up buying the house anyway. I don't remember. But it's a pretty good one. That has almost nothing to do with anything. I could have just stopped right there where Marge became a realtor because she's okay. taking the realty test. And um, Lisa comes along and teaches her how to how to remember things using mnemonic devices and in um in one example she gives she says in, you can put uh, like something you're trying to remember to a song like in 1215 at runny me do da do da the nobles and the king agreed oh do do da day <laughs> that's great that is one of my uh, go-to <laughs> references for the magna carta you know what mine is funny enough man that was a tortured intro no, I thought it was great. Hmm. Simpsons reference? That's Flayed classic alive stuff you should know. is what it was. I thought it was fantastic. Well, thank you. And I've never heard that. I don't remember that episode, and I've never heard that little jingle. So it's a great it's episode. In my brain. Vintage classic Simpsons. Uh, when I think of Magna Carta, I think of Johnny Dangerously, the movie with mm-hmm. uh, Michael Keaton, the very funny spoof movie, mm-hmm. because at one point, uh, I think the someone is on death row and they're being read fake last rites by a fake priest as they walk down uh-huh. the green mile uh-huh. and they're just sort of making up Latin terms. And he goes, <laughs> Magna Carta, Master Charger. <laughs> and I saw that in the theater when I was whatever, like 10 or 11. Uh-huh. And I've remembered that ever since. Yeah. It gets in your na- in your uh, your head, those two mm-hmm. words. They, they go really well together. They have a tendency to stick around. And then also like, you get the idea when you when you kind of like perk your little ears up about this Magna Carta thing that it was kind of pretty important. People people tend to put a lot of stock into it. Yeah, and uh jeez, well, now I'm, I'm looking and I can't even see what Magna Carta, what does it mean? Uh Great Charter. The Great Charter, of course. Yeah, and technically the name f- that of the Magna Carta what we're talking about. We'll get into all like the little details and everything in a second, but um It's called the Magna Carta Libertarum. Right. So it's the Great Charter of Liberties is what it it really is. And a lot of people, like I was saying, they put a lot of stock into it. They basically say say that this is the wellspring, at least in the U.K. and America, and and by extension Australia and Canada, of human rights, of like civil rights, of the basic rights that every citizen has, that like that all kind of came from this document. And that before that— there really wasn't that kind of stuff. And you have to really narrow your focus here because in this time period we're talking about around the <clears throat> like 12th and 13th centuries CE, 
Like, England was still kind of figuring out which way it was going. At the same time, if you went to the Arab world, you would find half a million people living in some cities. Well, there was like 10,000 people living in London. Mm -hmm. If you went to the West, to modern-day St. Louis, the Cahokia Mound civilization— had like 15,000 people living there. China had been running a bureaucracy for a good thousand years by this time. So this is new to England and the English and their their uh, descendants and ancestors around this, this time and this era. But if you narrow it like that, then, yeah, you can make a pretty good case that for you and me and mm-hmm. those of us born in America, you can trace your civil liberties pretty directly back to this document. Yeah, and like even if the document itself, as we'll learn, uh, wasn't necessarily honored initially or even later, Mm -hmm. um, it was it was that seed that was planted that uh, it had to be at least, uh, and we'll and we'll see later on. You know, once it was in place, you kind of couldn't go backwards from there. Yeah, even though some people did try later on, (laughs) uh, some royalty. It, it just didn't happen. So it it sort of drew a line in the sand and said, all right, from this point forward, at least, things for uh, people, any people other than, not every person, but people other than royalty, at least, will, won't go backwards from here. No, and like you said, they tried. They in definitely theory. wanted to. But when you lay down something like people have rights that are basic to them from the moment they're born— that's a tough one to repeal. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Once sure. that's out there, that's that's tough to put it back in the box. And good. That's good for us. Bad for despotic, absolutist monarchs, though. <laughs> so should we get into a little background here? Yeah, I think we should because we got, we got some ground to cover. Yeah. So uh, the Grabster helped us with this. And you could t- – I love it. You know, you can tell when, uh, when our writers are really into something uh-huh. by sort of – how much background they give us on stuff before they get to the stuff. Yeah. I think that I think <laughs> Ed was into it. I think he was wearing chain mail while he was writing this. <laughs> he may have been, but Ed did a great job with the setup. And, you know, we, we have to point out that this was a time, like you said, where there was a king that ruled the land and everyone had to do what the king said, basically. And then you had, uh, you know, you had people that ruled over smaller fiefdoms throughout the land, but they still answered to the king, but they had their subjects as well. But it was it was a bit of a mess. Like, even though the king could kind of do what they wanted, the king usually knew, like, hey, I can't push things too far, otherwise it gets really bad for me. Right. So let me see if I can walk right up to that line as often as I can, mm-hmm. in many cases, as far as royalty is concerned. Mm-hmm. And sort of push things as far as like, you know, wringing money out of people uh, for bribes or, or quote unquote taxes or, uh, you know, trying just ruling with a harsh hand, but not necessarily a hand that will be so bad that the people revolt. Yeah, that was a fine line. And so some kings in the history of England were, were really good at being kings. Uh, I get the impression that the more land you conquered in the name of England, the more people you brought under your rule, um, the happier you could keep the like the the barons, the people who um, own the land that that you know kind of all collectively made up your kingdom, uh, the better off you were. But yeah, you still were going to need money to run things, so you're going to have to extract that stuff. So you had to just push it just as far as you could. That was a good king. There were also plenty of bad kings who would go way past the line. And they were they, they, they could be allowed to do that because in England, kings were divinely decreed by God. Their authority was derived directly from God. So whatever they did, no matter how unhappy that made you, God said it, so this king is allowed to do it. In practice, that didn't actually, like, work out all the time. Like, it's not like the barons were like, what are you going to do? God God said. But, right. But they, there was still kind of that air, that aura around it. And at the very least, even if you didn't buy into that directly, that was the custom and had been for a really long time, and that's hard to buck. So you had good kings who still went up the line. You had bad kings who crossed the line. And when you put it all together— 
more often than not, that line was being really kind of made to feel claustrophobic. And so the barons would be unhappy. And they were the ones with the power. So if you push the barons too far, they would push back. And then you would end up with things like written laws and customs and decrees that said the king won't do this anymore. Right. Uh, and there's also a third group in there of kings that just weren't very good at their job. Yeah. Like, I think history often, like, they often overlook sheer incompetence in favor of, you know, like, this person did all these great things or this person was an evil tyrant. Mm -hmm. And, like, some of them just weren't too good at it. Yeah, the... the um, Like, the day-to-day. -day. The Franklin Pierces of the English <laughs> Ooh. king lineage. Uh, so, we'll skip up to Henry I uh, in 1100 created the Charter of Liberties, and this was sort of, if the Magna Carta was the seed of uh, liberty for people like you and me later, the Charter of Liberties may have been the, the pre-seed to that seed yeah. in a way, because it was the first kind of official thing that limited the king's power just a bit. Uh, and in this case, there were other things, but it did limit the king's power to appoint uh, church offices, um, guaranteed that any, like, inheritances would be carried forth, uh, and there were no bribes necessary. So just sort of, like, cleaned up the the act of the royals in the sort of smallest of ways. Yeah, because before it was like you could, if you were the king, you could be like, yeah, I don't care. Give me some money if you want to be legally married, or give me some money if you um, want to be promoted in your church ranking. Like, you could just extract money for anything. And so this is the first time where it was kind of like, okay— We'll go. We, we won't do that. We won't keep pushing things like you were saying. Like it just kind of cleaned up the the monarchy and limited their ability. And it was kind of a big thing. And again, that came out of a bad king. That was um, Henry, Henry the first, who had to clean up the mess left by his successor or his predecessor, William the second, his brother, who'd been a bad king, had overtaxed, had overstepped the boundaries, and now there had to be some sort of document created to say we won't do that again. This is where laws came from in, in England, like people overstepping bounds and being pushed back on. Right, or the king just arbitrarily deciding things. Yeah. So Henry I dies, uh, succeeded by Stephen I. And this one was a little dicey because Stephen I's ascension to the throne was uh, contested and resulted in a civil war called the Anarchy. Uh, and the anarchy was was a mess. It was a, a pretty brutal, lawless time. And um, Stephen, I think, he wasn't around too long, but he was quickly followed by Henry II, who ruled for about 35 years. Yeah. I think right at 35 years. And this was at the end of the anarchy. But Henry II comes in and basically says, all right, the royals are back, baby. And there are going to be a bunch of reforms here. We're going to centralize our power. Things have gotten out of hand with this anarchy. And uh, it's all under my control now. Um, and in, in a way, this was – it was good and bad. It's its never great when someone assumes his absolute authority. Right. But it's also better just to have a more structured, codified system than all these weird, arbitrary laws that were kind of all over the place and scattered about before. Exactly, yeah. So, and one of the reasons why Henry II did that is because he was um, very much into adventurism. He would, oh, yeah. he would go out of England and try to conquer more lands, and <clears throat> that was his big thing. Parasailing, that was his thing. <laughs> yeah. So he needed, he needed some, basically some, some structure that he could set in place that didn't require him to be there all the time right. to oversee it. And some of that, like, actually kind of benefited people. Um, in part because, like you said, it, was, it wasn't it was arbitrary anymore. And there were, like, some real reforms. Like, he set up a panel of judges that would go around and, and basically carry out criminal trials rather than just people getting away with crimes or maybe being subject to mob justice. They were trying to apply some sort of actual justice to it. Um, uh, you could now, if you were a serf or a peasant, you could complain to the king and go over the lord of the the manor that you worked on's head 
if he was mistreating you. Like, that was brand new. And so there was, like, some good things that were set in place by Henry II. He wasn't, like, some benevolent guy or anything like that, but he, he did leave that legacy. And it was, a, it was a big deal. A lot of people point to his code as the beginning of English common law. Yeah, he was he was not a great guy. He was, in fact, a pretty brutal uh, person on the battlefield, and he would uh, brutal leader. He would, and he and he did a good job leading on the battlefield, and he loved going to war. Mm-hmm. But he would cut the feet off uh, or the um, genitals from his enemies. Mm-hmm. Uh, he would, you know, lock people in the dungeons. He was known supposedly for gouging out the eyes of a young messenger boy one time who delivered bad news. Uh, so he wasn't some great guy, and he was also, like, he had to finance all of these travails and wars all over the place, mm-hmm. and that cost a lot of money. So a lot of what he did when he when he brought all this under his order was made a lot of money and raised a lot of revenue uh, and was kind of just squeezing every last bit he could out of these landowners, again, with those kind of fees like you were talking about, like, hey, if you're a widow and you want to remarry— uh, pay me. All right. If you want to inherit some land or a title, pay me. Yeah. If it, maybe you can even bribe me. I'm, you know, I'm open to that. Right. Which is arbitrary in and of itself because the person doesn't necessarily deserve whatever it is they're bribing the king for uh, in exchange for, and that's, you know, that's not good. It's also in direct violation of the uh, Charter of Liberties that Henry the First had laid out. And now that there was that, now that that had been established by Henry I, the nobility could point to that and be like, you're not honoring this stuff. Like, this is something we can hold your feet to the flames over. It didn't necessarily work with Henry II um, because he was such a strong king, but it was it was something that they could point to and they could say, like, this is wrong and here's why. Yeah, and, you know, there's something I meant to point out at the beginning that that I'll bring up here that's really— kind of integral to how all of this worked back then is it was sort of a, a three-way dance between um, nobility, these really wealthy, influential barons, and then the church. And like, those are the three big pieces of the puzzle that like everyone kind of had to be happy among that group mm-hmm. to a certain degree, mm-hmm. or there were big problems. Uh, and it was al- always sort of that dance with the royalty to sort of make sure that like they were extracting money from the barons, but they, they didn't want to make them too unhappy because I said they would revolt. Mm-hmm. But you also had to satisfy the church, which technically was a separate entity, which we'll get to in a minute. Mm-hmm. But the push and pull among these three groups was really uh, pr- a pretty key thing to how everything operated back then. Yeah. Um, and w- I, that was an excellent point because the church was like a state unto itself, right? It could make its own money <clears throat> and um, – This was at a time when the prevailing economic theory was that there was like a finite amount of money in the in the world. So when you were extracting money from like the barons, whether you were the church or whether you were the king, like that really hurt, hurt more than it, you know, it does paying taxes today, because there's this idea that that like that was it. There there was like a a zero sum game. Everybody was taking and exchanging from the same pot. Um, so yeah, if you could kind of balance all those three together, you had a pretty stable monarchy, but more often than not, it was like we were saying, people kind of push things over the edge. Henry II definitely did that with the bribery, but again, he was a strong monarch. Um, and then he was, he was succeeded by a couple of, um, people that are kind of studies in contrast as far as kings of England go, don't you think? Yeah, maybe let's take a break. That's a great cliffhanger. Okay. Okay. Who could these two people be? Laurel and Hardy? <laughs> C.C. DeVille. Could it be the Hardy Boys? Which, like with uh, Parker Stevenson and what's his other name? I bet you that's who it is. The other guy. Poor other guy. Learning stuff with Joshua and Charles. Stuff you should know. <laughs> We're back. Parker Stevenson and Fred Noonan <laughs> oh, <poor laughs> were the Fred two Hardy Noonan. boys. 
Mm-hmm. No, uh, you're talking about Richard and then John. Uh, we'll start with Richard. Mm-hmm. Uh, Henry II died, and his son Richard the Lionhearted uh, inherited the throne, and he was beloved. And he did a lot of crusades as well and had a lot of great military successes and, uh, you know, had to spend a lot of money to do so, of course. Right. But he died unexpectedly, and then Henry II, his, um, his dad was Henry II, his son John took over the throne. And remember when I mentioned earlier that some some people just were not good at their job? Yes. Th- this was John. He was a, just not good at being a politician, not mm-hmm. good at being a king, not good at getting along with the barons in the church. He was just not cut out for it. Yeah, and he's the main bad guy. I think we I wondered if Richard the 3rd was the main bad guy or the king in the Robin Hood legend. It's uh-huh. King John. Oh, is it really? Yeah, cuz I remember Richard okay. the Lionheart is like off fighting the crusades and King John's running the show in a mean and incompetent way. That's who Robin Hood's fighting and the Sheriff of Nottingham. But Ooh. but in real life, John was just, a, he was not meant to be a king. You know, he was Richard's brother. Uh, he was the younger brother. And Henry II, their father, didn't even, for one, he didn't even name John after a king. Um, and he didn't give him any land. Um, so there was no, no, no area for him to rule. He was sent off to like study with scholars. That's what he was supposed to be. So he was never bred to be a king and he wasn't a very good one regardless because of that or, or just naturally. But his first nickname uh, among the nobility was John Lackland because he didn't have any really? land. Yeah. Because he lacked land. It must have really burned him, you know? That's pretty funny. But he was terrible. <laughs> and But more to the point, like, not only was he, like, bad with money and, like, he was a despot in a lot of ways, too. He lost land. Remember I said the kings that were most beloved were the ones that, like, added to the kingdom? Sure. The ones that were the most despised were the ones who lost land from the kingdom, and that was what John did almost out of the gate. Yeah, he was losing land to uh, King Philip II of France. And, uh, you know, Ed points out, and it's important to know here that, you know, England and France back then were, it's not like it is today. Like, they were very intertwined. Um, England held a lot of land in the north of France, and they were constantly kind of going back and forth about, like, winning and taking land from one another. Mm-hmm. So it's it's you got to have to kind of un- deprogram yourself from how you think of those two countries today to think about how it was back then. Um, So he was losing land to King Philip II. And uh, Philip liked John's cousin, Arthur of Brittany, and he had a competing claim to the throne. So Philip was in Arthur's court. And, you know, John just wasn't doing a good job. He was blowing through money, which meant he had to get more money out of the barons than even his predecessors did. That's right. And he was not winning land with this money. So he was... He was just going down the tubes fast. Yeah. And one one thing I saw, Chuck, I just want to mention, these the English um, were so intertwined with the French at the time that these kings that we're talking about, Henry II, Richard the Lionhearted, uh, John Lackland, they all spoke French. Isn't that interesting? Yeah. The English king spoke French at the time. Oh, sure. Like when you go to – if you look at any of the old movies that are historically accurate, mm-hmm. it, it's really hard to make sense of any of it when – like people from France are sending their daughter to England to marry into the, it's like it's it's really confusing and I don't know if it's about the family lines but it's it it is super confusing like the um oh like Catherine the Great mm-hmm. and some of this comes from watching TV <laughs> I'll right. admit yeah <laughs> but that TV show The Great is really good because I think wasn't Catherine the Great Russian yes. Or she was married off to the Russians. I'm not sure if she was a born Russian. I don't know. It's all just very confusing. Oh, yeah. But, I mean, that was a really good way to consolidate power and to gain oh, yeah. even more land um, would be to to marry, like, another royal family and just put your stuff together, make, your, sure. make yourselves even harder to, to I do. I might have gotten that all wrong, by the way, but it was off the dome, as the kids say. Hey, that's all right, man. Off the dome is pretty great. Uh, all right, so John is, uh, you know, I talked about the sort of three-prong thing. John is not doing well. He is ticking off the barons because he's having to squeeze more money out of them. Mm-hmm. So it's like, oh, well, surely he at least 
did okay with the church, right? <laughs> to keep that uh, stool stable. Not true at all. Uh, Pope Innocent III was in charge at the time, and he appointed a new bishop of Canterbury named Stephen Langton, who would turn out to be a big thorn in John's side. Uh, John did not want Langton, mm-hmm. and so he got mad and basically took his ball and went home. Uh, he took control of Canterbury, uh, all the churches possessions and said, Langton, you can't even come in the country. Yeah. And so Innocent the Third said, oh, yeah, you know what? I'm going to issue a papal degree that basically all church services in England aren't valid anymore and you can't hold them. And, you know, if it was you and me, we'd be like, sweet, we don't have to go to church anymore. Right. But it wasn't like that back then. It was a really big deal. Uh, Ed said this was like dropping an ecclesiastical nuclear bomb onto Britain, and that's kind of true. Yeah, because also the church was a huge employer in uh, England at the time, too. So now all the people who work in the church's jobs are like, well, are, are, are we valid? What's going on here? Or, you know, do we have the same protections that we used to? It, it was a big, big deal. And yeah, for all intents and purposes, England under King John was at war with um, the uh, the church under Innocent the Third, and it stayed that way for a little while, um, and th- that just put John. That was it. That was the last box to be checked. Like he was at odds with absolutely everybody, uh, and was a very unpopular king by anybody's anybody's measure. Um, whether you were a commoner or whether you were nobility or whether you were a bishop, you did not like. King John very much. And then add to that that the guy that um, Innocent III appointed to the Archbishop of Canterbury, and this is also, by the way, after the last Archbishop of Canterbury, Thomas Becket, had been murdered at the behest of John's father, Henry II, um, murdered brutally, too. Was, I read a first-person account of it. It's one of the more ghastly murders I've ever heard. Um, but the guy who came in, Stephen Langton, he was like a, a progressive. He was basically writing about things that question the, the divine authority of the monarchy, mm-hmm. how some people, or not some people, but people had some natural rights, like all people had some natural rights that even a king couldn't violate. Like really progressive stuff. And this guy's coming into England at a time when it has one of its weakest kings in its history and it basically set the stage for the Magna Carta to to uh, kind of be uh, written. <laughs> Full stop. <laughs> what else did you uh, want me to add? Could I have dressed it up more, put a little fruit on its head? No, no, no. Just your voice went up, so I thought there was more. That's fine. Oh, I was using uh, Upspeak. I was using okay, Upspeak. <laughs> So you might be asking yourself, like, kind of what's the big deal? Because things were a mess at various points in history, and there were revolts before, and there was unrest before uh, between the church and and the royals. And it was like, why was this the big one that kind of made everything change? And there are there are a few reasons for this, um, one of which, you know, I talked about France and England being so intertwined. Uh, John lost land, but he lost Normandy, which was a really big deal. Um, the Normans, uh, England had a lot of land in northern France, like I said earlier, since William the Conqueror uh, got control of Normandy at the Battle of Hastings. And the Normans were a tight group, and they were very influential in England. And then when John lost Normandy, it was, uh, it was more than just losing land. It was, a, it was a big deal. Yeah, they started calling him John Soft Sword after that. <laughs> Did they really? <laughs> yeah, that was his, oh, wow. his second nickname. John Lackland and John Softsword. <laughs> uh, the church at the time, like we said, was uh, was separate. And so they had their own set of laws even. They didn't have to, to – they had their ecclesiastical laws. So if a church official ran afoul, they were – you know, they could say, no, 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 the king isn't going to uh, declare judgment on you. You come over here with us. We have our church law. It's probably not as stiff, mm-hmm. to be honest. Mm-hmm. Uh, and And basically John said, you know, forget that. Uh, tradition. You guys are under my rule and my decrees. And again, this just sent him further down the toilet. Yeah. Um, And then, like I was saying— There were no toilets back then, though, to be clear. (laughs) Into the privy. The bedpan. Yes. Um, And then add to that also that the um, the, just the way that people thought about the monarch, like thanks to people like Stephen Langton, the new Archbishop of Canterbury, um, and the fact that the uh, the, um, 
Henry the First's document of liberties, a Charter of Liberties, uh, had had already been established. Like, just people were just thinking about things differently, and all of this stuff kind of came together at this vortex. Um, and there was a there was a, a point where finally John was like, okay, I, at the very least, I need to be in with the the Pope, and basically knelt before the Pope and said, England is is a vassal state to um, the Church again. Mm-hmm. Which is a big deal, um, but it put it put John and England back in Pope Innocent the Third's good graces, and they were fine again. But that did nothing to um, help the barons. Uh, and as a matter of fact, um, the barons were just as put upon as before. But now John was even more emboldened by having the full support of the right. Pope again, and so the barons said, "You know what? Forget this." enough of this. It's 1214 and it's time for some change. So they actually cobbled together uh, a fighting force and took London by 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 force. They stormed it and occupied London uh, in open rebellion against King John. It's only 10,000 people though. Yes, that's true. <laughs> it really was, which no, is funny. Kidding. Well, it's funny to think of now. I mean, like 10,000 people living in London, but that's just the way it was at the time. So, yeah, you and I could probably take London with 10,000 people, but <laughs> it's still significant to, to mention. Yeah, and, and, and our smartphones, that's all we'd need. <laughs> yeah, look at and this. a boomstick. <laughs> huh? Have you ever seen a dog say, I love you? Well, I've got a video of it. <laughs> that's right. Oh, my God, they're bowing. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it wasn't a civil war, but it was, it was a big deal. It was an open rebellion. John knew this was not a good thing. So in 1215, he said, all right, I got to make peace with these people too. So let's get together. Uh, we'll get that Langton guy that I didn't like at all. This shows you how much I'm coming with my hat in hand. Yeah, really. He can act as the mediator. The Baron said, here's what we want. Uh, we'll call it the Article of Barons, and handed that to Langton. Mm-hmm. And Langton said, "All right, I got to whip this into something that that John could, is going to actually live with." And so he drafted this initial document, uh, which included a lot of the stuff from the Charter of Liberties that dealt with a lot of this, the you know, the laws that were sort of on the books, but also had some had some big ideas, uh, like you were talking about about just general rights at birth of humans. And they met, uh, ask Lisa Simpson where they met, where? Running Mead, 1215 when? at Running Mead. <laughs> June 19th, 1215. Mm-hmm. And they signed over fealty to John and they made copies of this thing, applied that royal seal on it. And that was it. It was the Magna Carta, even though they didn't call it the Magna Carta yet. No. And um, I was like, why Runnymede? <clears throat> it turns out there's actually a few reasons why Runnymede uh, had a, a history of being an ancient kind of council meeting spot. Um, okay. It's it was also nice, nice place. Uh, well, it was a boggy meadow, um, oh. which is another reason why it was chosen, because it would be a terrible place to fight a war or a oh, battle. Okay. And then gotcha. also, like, you could see basically in every direction from it. So right. you couldn't do a surprise <laughs> attack either, even yeah, if yeah. you wanted to fight in a boggy meadow. So I, I thought it might have been like a really nice picturesque thing, but it was done out in the middle of nowhere where you could see everything. Yeah, well, I get the impression that it was picturesque still as well, but um, that it like had a, a lot of strategic strategic um, uh, uh, assets to it too. Okay, well, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, all right, well, I guess— Well, before we take our break, let's just talk about the fact that this first Magna Carta that was not even called the Magna Carta yet was ignored. Uh, John ignored it. Uh, Innocent III said it's not even legal. Um, John was under duress to agree to this thing. Mm -hmm. And then a real full civil war called the First Barons' War broke out. And uh, John died of dysentery in 1216. It's kind of what ended the First Barons' War. Mm -hmm. But this is all sort of preamble to the— the real Magna Carta, which we'll talk about in just a sec. Learning stuff with Joshua and Charles, stuff you should Joshua and Charles, stuff you should know. 
All right, Chuck. So we'll, well, let's talk in a second about how the Magna Carta was applied shortly after John died of dysentery. Um, but first, you have to. Like, we should talk a little bit about like what it actually looked like originally, because, like you said, it wasn't even what we think of the Magna Carta today. It had a lot of stuff in it that has nothing to do with nobody alive today. Mm-hmm. There was like <clears throat> the basically the king's strong arm guy who went around and, like, extracted money and tortured nobles for, if they didn't pay up. He and his cohorts are named specifically by name as, mm-hmm. like, they got to go. There was stuff about, you know, if you were a widow, you didn't have to marry immediately. But if you did end up wanting to get married later, you still had to go to the king. There was about, like, land inheritance, st- all sorts of stuff like that that really would have mattered to a baron, uh, you know, a, no, a noble person, a nobleman or a woman in mm-hmm. England at the time. There, there were concessions. But then, like you said, there were big ideas too. But if you were like the average peasant working the land to serf, uh, working the land in the feudal system in England at the time, you could not have made heads or tails of this. Because number one, it was written in abbreviated Latin. Yeah. Which would have made it very hard to understand. But then number two, it was also written as one long... I think about 3,000, 3,100 word paragraph. Yeah. That I don't even think had punctuation in it either. It was it was written like it was, you know, by a mad, mad man. <laughs> yeah. It was like written on a big long piece roll of toilet paper. <laughs> right. Exactly. And that was rolled up. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it is now, like if you read the Magna Carta now, it is separated it into uh, different clauses. Yeah. But this was not the case at first. This happened... Uh, Years later, who was the historian? I think it was William Blackstone in the late 18th century. Yeah, basically said, like, I got to organize this thing. This like, you know, mess. this is going to, we, we can't put this thing in museums. It's embarrassing. Yeah. <laughs> like, people got to be able to make heads or tails of this. So that, that happened later on. At first, it was, like you said, just a, this big long scrawl. Mm-hmm. And there wasn't just one of them. It's not like you can go to, uh, you know, if you go to see the Declaration of Independence and, at the archives in DC, uh-huh. like that's that's the one. That's the master the one a, copy. That's the master charge. The master <laughs> copy. That's right. There were thirteen known copies in twelve fifteen of the Magna Carta, mm-hmm. and there wasn't. It's, it's not like they had one and then they ran it through the Xerox machine. Mm-hmm. They just they wrote it down thirteen times. Right. They're all originals, I guess. It's, it's maybe it's wrong to say there isn't an original when there are thirteen originals. Right. There's not a sole original. Um, four of these have survived. And there are little variations because they were written by hand and transcribed, but nothing that, like, cancels anything out. It's just sort of, you know, how somebody might transcribe something. And they're all considered for, like, legit correct originals. Uh, I think two of them are at the British Library of London, uh-huh. one at Salisbury Cathedral, and then one at Lincoln Castle. Yes. And then if you go research how many Magna Carta uh, copies are there today, you'll find that there's a lot more than four. And here you start to get into just how muddied the history of the Magna Carta is. Because yeah. like you said, when they first wrote this Magna Carta, it wasn't exactly like what we think of Magna Carta today. Um, it had a lot more provisions in it that had to do with the forest Mm-hmm. And there were so many things, rules and regulations about how to treat the forest, how you can act in the forest. If you live in the forest, who do you go, you know, claim a grievance to, that kind of stuff. That a separate charter of the forest was created, like those were basically moved out. And then the document became the Magna Carta that, that we understand it today. Um, right. And that was, I think, in 1217 when that finally happened. Yeah, 1217, the Charters of the Forest was moved out. And then um, little by little, this document kept getting, like, adjusted, added to. As a new king came along, they would they would basically be like, I love the Magna Carta. I'm going to adhere to it. And slowly but surely, over the next couple decades, it became accepted and respected as the law of the land in England. Like, it was a lot more than just concessions to end the the civil war, of the the war of the barons. It became established law in England. Yeah, and and just those words are very, like, it's easy now to sort of not think too much about what law of the land means. But back then, that was a very big deal in that 
this was the first time that laws came about that weren't directly from the king. Um, yeah, it wasn't thing. royalty just saying, here's how everything is, everybody, fall in line. It was the people, and albeit it was, you know, if you were a, a, a baron, you had a lot of money and you had a lot of political sway. It's not like it was, it's not like these were the serfs, you know, like uh, slinging hay in the hay fields mm-hmm. that had any kind of input. Um, so we do need to point that out, but they were not royalty. So it was a big deal for the very first time. Um, actual um, subjects of the king were weighing in and and successfully weighing in on what the law should be. Yeah, and there were there were like the the seeds to things that would become really important later, like the idea that um, a council of barons, I think twenty five barons, um, could could basically hold the king to account, mm-hmm. and it was like the seed that eventually grew into the parliament. Um, there was another one. There were there were some other really big ones in there that that over time. One of the things that happened over time, I guess, Chuck, is it got extended to everybody in England, not just yeah. what they called freemen, which were landed nobility. Uh, it got extended to everybody in England at least by 1297 when it was encoded into law in England, at the latest by like the 1400s, the 15th century. Um it became just commonly understood that, like, those those rights, those laws in the Magna Carta applied to everybody in England. Yeah, I mean, it was like this sacred document. Uh, and again, when you you kind of had no choice when you came in there as a new king. Um, you may try and alter and change some things, but you couldn't refute the Magna Carta at that point. It was it, it became too important, even if other laws superseded it later on to the point where its actual laws in the Magna Carta were rendered useless in a lot of circumstances. Mm -hmm. It was a symbol, uh, and it had this, uh, like Ed said, it had this really powerful aura about it uh, because it was the first laws not decreed directly from the king's voice. Mm -hmm. So you you couldn't go back anymore. You could only move forward, even if it was was by tiny increments. We're talking about, um, I mean, the... 13, 1400s, you know, this is a long time ago, and it's going to take a long time. <laughs> and Ed points out that, like, we, humanity has always been creeping toward more rights for more people. Yeah. Uh, even if it's very slow and very clumsy at times. And the Magna Carta was sort of the foundation on what a lot of the modern rights that we have sort of lay. Yeah, like, there's there's a couple that are actually still in English law, Um Part of one, the first clause, which gives freedom to the church. Mm -hmm. Um, Number 13, which uh, basically says that um, towns and municipalities have the ability to decide their own matters, like electing a mayor, that kind of stuff. Right. And then the big ones, the two big ones that were really huge when they were codified in the Magna Carta back in 1215 was um, Clause 39, which basically says that you uh, cannot be just thrown in prison. You can't be exiled. You can't have your land taken away. None of those things can happen to you unless it's through the the lawful judgment of your peers or the law of the land. Yeah, so big it one. took away the king's arbitrary ability to throw somebody in the dungeon until they starved to death because they didn't pay him some bribe that he wanted. That was enormous, and that today. Uh, constitutes due process uh, under the law, and then also habeas corpus, where you can't just like put someone in prison for no reason or never giving a reason. And those are re- that's really huge, and that is where directly where we we get that from in America and the West. Yeah. Then the other one is um, clause forty. There's you, you you cannot sell, and you also cannot deny or delay the rights that people have. As citizens, you you right. you you're, you can't do that. So that was a big deal. And then the idea that the Magna Carta um, directly led to the Bill of Rights um, is is not an understatement at all. At the Constitutional Convention, when they were thinking of whether they needed a, a any kind of Magna Carta shout out, because it had a mythical quality in America by this time too, um, to kind of keep 
the king of England at bay. Uh, right. They thought, well, we're not going to have a king here. We don't need a Magna Carta. And somebody very wisely pointed out, no, we don't have a king, but the government still acts at the behest of the majority of the people. What if yeah. the majority of the people try to infringe on the rights of others? We need something. And so they came up with the Bill of Rights directly uh, descended from the Magna Carta. So it is very much an important document for sure. Totally. Still relevant. Still relevant as ever. So everybody... Go out and get a Magna Carta copy, maybe a poster or a T-shirt, and rock it proudly. <laughs> you got anything else? I got nothing else. All right. Well, uh, Chuck said he's got nothing else then. That means it's time for listener mail. Uh, I'm going to call this kind correction on jackalopes. can't believe we walked right past this. Okay. Hey, guys. longtime listener and super fan of the show. I feel like we are friends since I listen to you every day as I get ready for work and very much look forward to your conversations. So as your friend, I can say that I absolutely love all your content, but found myself cringing throughout the Jackalope episode. Oh, no. You see, I am a uh, the historic preservation officer for the city of Las Vegas, Nevada. And while the Jackalope lore is not prevalent throughout Nevada, I still feel the need to weigh in on a bit of misunderstanding about our southwestern fauna. The Jack and Jackalopes is for the Jackrabbit, of course. Very large species of hare, not a rabbit, as in the cute little cottontail rabbit. Mm -hmm. The lope is for the pronghorn antelope, not a deer, you guys. Uh, These are two different families. Gentlemen, the clue is right there in the name of antelope. How did we miss that? It's not a jack of deer. I think we were so jazzed about even talking about jackalopes that we, we stopped seeing the forest for the trees. Maybe so. Uh, however... A pronghorn is not a true antelope even, but that's another story. And further, pronghorn have horns, hence the name, which are affixed to the skull, which of course means that to put horns on the jackrabbit, the pronghorn must be deceased as well. Uh, however, deer antlers shed annually with no harm done to the deer. Uh-huh. You can walk in any area where deer live and find antlers on the ground. Therefore, deer does not necessarily have to die to give up his antlers. Okay, that's uh, good. While there are cert- yeah, that's good. Uh, while there are certainly are taxidermy rabbits and hares, with deer antlers affixed to their heads. A jackalope, by definition, is a jackrabbit with pronghorn horns. I see. Just wanted to give a little gentle correction on all that, but in no way diminishes my love for the show. Thank you for all you do. All my best. Dr. Diane C. Seabrant, Historic Preservation Officer, Las Vegas, Nevada. Excellent. Dr. Seabrant? Dr. Diane C. Seabrant. Oh, okay. C. Seabrant. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Dr. Seabrant. We appreciate that big time. Hats off to you for that gentle correction. That was really something. Uh, if you want to get in touch with us like Dr. Seabrant did, you can via email. Wrap it up, spank it on the pronghorn, and send it off to stuffpodcast at iheartradio.com. Stuff You Should Know is a production of iHeartRadio. For more podcasts from iHeartRadio, visit the iHeartRadio app. Apple Podcasts, or wherever you listen to your favorite shows.